Hi, welcome to this first in a series of webinars. Um, my name is Dr. Colin Dowding. I'm senior lecturer at the University of Lincoln School of Engineering. My research background is in high power laser interactions with materials. Specifically, I use short wavelength lasers, so ultraviolet. Today, I'm going to talk through some of the basic concepts of uh, the physics underlying in laser interactions with materials and talk through uh, some of the, the, the details of why we choose certain lasers for certain jobs, the difference between lasers, how a laser beam interacts with material, and try and give you a flavour as to their applications in industry. Okay, so we start off, it looks fairly fancy in here. We've actually got um, four lasers that can be seen quite easily, and I'll point those out. So we start off, um, we've got this case up here, uh, this one, I'll go through what the different terms mean in a second. 200 watt CO2, it's carbon dioxide laser inside the tube. Uh, you think 200 watts, it's like a, a strong living room light, basically a light bulb in overall power, but it's all in a single wavelength. So this one produces a wavelength of light of 10.6 microns. Now, to give you an idea, the human eye can see somewhere between 350 nanometers and 850 nanometers, so between 0.35 and 0.85 microns wavelength. So this is really long, we can't see this. Infrared, and a lot of people have heard of infrared, infrared is a stream of heat, it's radiation of heat. So with a further imaging camera, you would see an extremely strong pickup of that. The 200 watt light bulb you have in your living room, that's producing its 200 watts of power, as it were, across a broad spectrum, so it's sharing that power across multiple different wavelengths. So this one is producing all 200 watts in a single wave band. Now, that's quite uh, a significant distinction. Some materials will absorb that particular wavelength extremely strongly, and so you're delivering a highly efficient uh, interaction between the beam and that material. So that's 200 watts up there. If we move down here to so this grey box with uh, orange stripes on it, it's quite large. This one is a uh, 60 watt, so it sounds quite small again, you know, you can buy much bigger light bulbs as it were in Woolco's, but rather than being infrared, this one produces ultraviolet. It's quite a special laser, it's called an excimer laser. Excimer is shortened, uh, a shortened version, contracted version of the word excited dimer. I'll explain how it works very briefly. This laser has a chamber inside it of two mirrors on either end, just like any other laser, but we can inject different gases into it. Now the gases, we store the active ones in here. Specifically, I can't open it because our air extraction system's not on, it's very dangerous. The one we have in there is a uh, fluorine. Now fluorine many of you are familiar with a little bit of uh, early, early 20th century history, is the nastier, more evil brother of chlorine. It will melt your lungs. It is a terrible, terrible stuff. We have it 5% um, concentration and a 95% balance of helium. So reasonably low concentration in, in the helium. We keep it safe inside this cabinet. We normally have an extraction system on, so that if we were to have a leak, get sucked out of a room. We take it out through these lines, we add onto it krypton, it's only a small bottle, krypton is very very expensive, um, and we also put in an extra balance of helium which is a big bottle of air. And the last thing we do is we add in a little bit of neon which is there. So these four gases flow around our pipes and into the back of the laser. The laser can control the concentration of a mixture of those gases together and they sit there in that chamber. Now critically, although fluorine is incredibly reactive, it won't normally mix with neon or krypton because those two are very, very, very stable. They're quite happy to sit there not reacting to anything else. However, this box is quite big because inside it, it's got lots of very big capacitors. So it charges up these capacitors to have the ability to drop about 135 to 150,000 volts into that chamber 200 times a second. So it flashes at 200 hertz. Now when 
those gases and those molecules get that sort of power, electrical power put across them, their electron shells get bigger, they grow, they jump, the, the electrons jump up on the size of their orbit. And suddenly that orbit's too big for the number of electrons there, and they think, oh, do you know what, I could really do with another electron in my orbit. I've, I can see another one over there, I'll grab that. And so it gra they grab onto the fluorine because it's reactive. In it comes, suddenly the energy level from the electricity drops away. 200 times a second this is happening, very, very quick. Drops away and thinks, oh, do you know what? I don't need to have this bigger orbit. I'll drop back down again. Don't need you to the fluorine. Pushes the fluorine away. Now as they part, what happens is it gives off energy. So you all heard of nuclear fission. It's a very similar idea, but instead of radiation coming out, or ionizing radiation, we get electromagnetic radiation coming out in the, in the form of a photon. And that photon has a characteristic wavelength, and in this case, for this mixture of gases, it's 248 nanometers. So we can't see it, it's too short, it's strong UV. UV, ultraviolet, gives you suntan. In this case, it's incredibly intense. So 60 watts um, in 248 nanometers wavelength, strong UV. The pulse, to give you an idea, from this laser lasts about 19 billionths of a second and it can do that pulse 200 times a second. And we take the average power from all of those and we get 60 watts. I'll explain that later on. Okay, so that's the next laser done. Now above it, we've got this laser here. So um, this has got, it's a fairly normal low power CO2 laser, exactly the same as that. So infrared, this one's only 27 watts, so nowhere near as powerful. However, on the front end, we've got a special unit. This black box here has got some special optics, which I'll draw a diagram of. That is called a set of galvanometric mirrors. So what we have is we have our laser comes out. We'll, we'll just draw that. So that's our source. Laser's coming out. Now, if you imagine in there, there's two mirrors. The first mirror is like that, and it can move around in that sort of orientation. So we can, we can scan the beam across like that. Okay? We've got a field, because we can do that with a mirror. That then lands on another mirror. Now, because it's a, a, a flat board, it's difficult to get the geometry right. But if you imagine, instead here, I've got a 45 degree mirror like that, which can do this, it now can send the beam like that. So all of a sudden, we've got a system that can actually scan a great big square area like that. And we can just track the laser anywhere we like within this area. It's called a marker laser. So small power, but great ability to move the beam around. We have to focus that beam, because as it comes out, this beam is actually about five or six millimeters in diameter. So 27 watts across five millimeters diameter is not very, very uh, high irradiance, not very much uh, laser energy per unit area. So what we do is we put it for a special beat, a special uh, lens, we call it an F theta lens. And what that lens does, it looks a bit like this in a cross section. Uh, it looks a bit like that. So what that lens is designed to do is it's designed to have varying focal length. Because if I were to do some simple trigonometry, that hypotenuse there is clearly Quite a lot short, quite a lot longer than this lo this ad adjacent here. So this has got a variable focal length a lot around the edges to make sure that as the beam scans in along here, it corrects the focal length. So we end up getting a flat level of focus along there. So we can scan along a flat surface anywhere in this area. So that's what an f theta lens does, and you can get different f theta lenses to do different focal lengths. And obviously if you change the focal length, you can increase the size of this field. So that's something that we've done with that laser, and it's won us quite a bit of research money, actually. Um, you can buy one of those if you're interested and you've got a lot of money for about 25, 26,000 pounds, just to play with a new garage if you wish. It just plugs into the wall. So that's CO2, infrared, it heats stuff up, it burns effectively. Um, you will often see them, if any of you have got um, engraved key rings with your name in it or you've won an award at school for sport, 
It'll probably have your name written in it. There's obviously, you do classic engraving, but today quite often it's actually done with a marker laser. So there's lots of things we've done. We actually made um, Princess Anne's uh, sort of trophy or commemorative plaque for opening the, opening our building, the school, three years ago, using that particular laser. So it's um, it's done a lot of things in its time with us. Okay, so now moving back onto my tour of different lasers in the room. So far I've talked about very, very long wavelength and very, very short wavelength stuff. I've not talked about very much in the middle. Now this one is one in the middle. Now this bit is the actual laser bit. It's quite small, you know, you can see from the size of, that's 15 centimetres, so you know, it's, it's not very big. But then all the electronics for it sits in this great big lump down here. So that's where a lot of the power handling's done. This isn't for air, this is all cabling in there. What we have in here is a, a neodymium doped YAG crystal. Okay? Now that crystal has got specific optical properties. We call that optical property fluorescence. It will um, absorb one wavelength of light or a, several, a, a band of wavelengths of light its electrons become excited and start to jiggle, jump up a level, and then when they drop back down again, they'll give a characteristic wavelength. In this case, a YAG laser, ND YAG laser, will produce a wavelength of 1064 nanometers, so 1.064 microns. So really long CO2, really short UV, just slightly too long for us to see. So we're just in a very near IR with this one. But a really cool thing about this laser, you can just put a special unit on the front of this and it's got um, a special crystal inside it. It's called a KTP crystal. I forget the uh, meaning of the acronym, but the KTP crystal is uh, another special material. So what that material does is the 1064 nanometers wavelength comes into it and it hits the atomic matrix of that crystal, that's that material. The atoms in that material, they vibrate due to being struck by the photons from this laser. But they vibrate at double the frequency that the 1064 light is oscillating at. And because they're vibrating at double the speed, they put out half wavelength following Maxwell's equations. So with this, we can double it with a KTP, a, a, a KTP crystal, the, the term is double it, even though you actually are halving the wavelength. So this one laser, it's only about 3 watts, it runs at 10 hertz, we can't change that, it's very, very stable. Um, 300 millijoules per pulse, or thereabouts, might not sound like a lot, so 0.3 of a joule, but 5 nanoseconds, delivers 0.3 of a joule in 5 billionths of a second. That is enough to literally, as soon as you focus it down, it just causes air to break down and spark. It causes the air to purely ionise, no fuel. So it's a lot of energy density if you use this properly. Um, 1064 at one end, extra block on, 532 nanometers. To give you an idea, 532 nanometers is green. You can see it, you can see a green laser beam. You can't see a green laser beam unless you stuff them away, but as soon as it hits something, like a bit of dust, you'll suddenly see it speckling in green. So whenever you see one of those cool photographs from the internet of someone leaning over playing with a laser, is probably green light. Our eyes like green light a lot. Give you an idea, we actually have twice the number of green receptors in our retina as we do any of the other colours. So uh, we tend to see green very, very strongly. If you see a photo of someone using a laser on the internet, more than likely going to be green or red because they have a common wavelength. So a really common wavelength for green is 532 nanometers. You can do other ones, 633. Uh, it's moving out of green, but. That's another common one from Copper Vapor Laser. Anyway, so talked about different wavelengths. Now I'm going to show you briefly on the board um, why different wavelengths matter. So I was talking just now about the fact we've got these different lasers with different wavelength abilities. So we've got 10.6 microns or two, then we've got um, the ability to go down to the near IR at 1064 nanometers and 532 nanometers for green, and then lastly we go down to the ultraviolet. Um, why? Who cares? What, what, what does that mean? Well, James Maxwell, um, he did a lot of work, very clever man, one of Scotland's greatest men, 
he uh, he did a lot of work with light, and he he really delved down into the understanding of why can we see colour? How does colour happen? What is the phenomenon we see as colour? Why is the spectrum there? What does it mean? And um, he really nailed down a lot of work about the electromagnetic spectrum because of it. And one of the things that we would now use is we we don't talk about um, we don't talk about electricity is or, or light as some sort of like miasma, some sort of like mythical stuff that can just pass through the universe. We talk about it as having a particle and wave duality. These particular ideas come from work following him, but he's one who really got it all started. Now, if you follow his equations, what you will see is if you've got a short wavelength, you get massive photons. Big photon means there are lots of electron volts contained, so lots of like, energy stored up in that photon. It's got the ability to transfer a lot of energy. So big photons for a short wavelength, longer wavelength, smaller photons. So, okay, if I just draw that in, it's a bit like that, it goes off to an asymptote into infinity. So let's just talk about what we've got then. Down here you've got really, really, really short uh, stuff. You've got the gamma, so ionising radiation, stuff that you know comes out of a nuclear bomb or from a nuclear power station. And then you're moving further on up here, maybe into the X-ray, and then finally we're getting into the ultraviolet along there. And then we're moving into visible, so this is like where we can see us, where we can see, and I'll put UV in there. Um, and then as we carry on out we've got uh, the infrared range and then lastly you're moving into microwave so I was talking about streams of heat CO2 laser produces infrared it's like a stream of heat what do you use to cook your food? you use something even longer you use a microwave that's infrared and then lastly there's a thing that you use to tune into your TV things you, choose, you use to tune into your radio you've got what we call radio waves at the far end so if you think of the energy states, radio waves are absolutely tiny little particles. So if we're talking about a particle wave duality. We can treat them as particles. You can, you can block them from getting through altogether if you use a small enough diff diffraction grating. But at the same time, you can cause them to diffract if they can get through. So there's lots and lots of different ways of looking at these things. But radio waves, very low energy, not a lot stops them because they're so small. Microwaves, MLW. Microwaves, again, if you think about it this way, say I've got a big, I say I've got a bowling ball, and I drop a bowling ball on an egg. It's going to crush the egg, it's going to make the egg just explode and crumple. Fine. Now if you imagine I have a marble, I drop a marble onto the egg, it'll probably still break the egg, but the egg will not be completely obliterated. We can think of that in terms of our photons. So my ultraviolet laser, the eczema laser, that's got massive, very big photons up, you know, in this range here. So we've got quite a lot of EV there. That's like dropping a bowling ball. When it hits the surface, when it hits the, the atomic matrix, it just causes the atoms to go, oh, there's too much, I'm, it's too much for my bond energy, there's too many electron volts being delivered, I'm going to jump off this matrix. And you literally dissociate the atoms, you get what's called a phase explosion, and instantaneous uh, sublimation. Now sublimation, um, that is where you go from a solid to a vapour instantly. There's no transition, you don't go through a liquid phase. After that, if there's any residual energy, it charges up that vapour and you get what's called an excited vapour or a plasma. So we quite often end up seeing a very bright little plume, that's a plasma plume, and that is a result of a material turning into a vapour and then taking the final part of a beam becoming extremely excited. Remember the beams go on for 5, maybe 20 nanoseconds, it probably only takes 1 nanosecond or even less to actually get the, to get the sublimation to happen. So, big old photons there, now let's go down to infrared, so the, the lasers I said which have got more, more power, 200 watt, 27 watt there, if we were to take the middle, so the 1064 one is going to sit about there, and the 10.6 micron one's going to sit roughly there. So now let's look at the um, let's look at the EV levels. So we're dropping down, aren't we? So here we've got something uh, 1064. 
we've got something more like, I don't know, a tennis ball. Drop a tennis ball, it's still going to do a fair old whack of damage instantly, so it's going to be a reasonably quick process, but often the photon levels here, the, the EV is not high enough to cause the atomic matrix to just break apart instantly. What tends to happen here is it would take one, it would take two or three photons to come in, cause an oscillation, if you look at that, so you'd have to have at least two of these to equal that size. I'm drawing it all roughly, obviously, but you can see you're going to need to have two of them to get up to that level. So if you need two photons to hit one atom before you get the atom to jump off, there must have been a time between there being the first photon colliding and the second photon colliding. If you have um, a unit of time to measure between the first and second instant, you're going to end up with a period in between that first and second where the atom is, is excited, it's being given some energy, it's just sitting there wobbling away, going, well, I've got some energy now, I can't get rid of it, I'm just vibrating until the second one comes along, excites it too much and it jumps off. Now that oscillation, if you can experience it over time, that's what we perceive as heat. That is thermal energy. So this now, as you go into the long wavelengths, is becoming a thermal process. If you then go to the CO2 lasers with their 10.6 micron beam, you're going to need loads and loads and loads of these to get up to one. So this is a really strong thermal process. Longer the wavelength, the more thermal it gets. And that explains how microwaves work as well. If I take the microwaves now, and run across here. So this is a microwave in your kitchen. The reason why that's such a thermal process, why it's so good at heating stuff, is because those photons, they don't cause the, the, the um, food to sort of like explode and immediately just uh, fall apart as an atomic matrix. They just cause the atoms in the food to juggle around a lot. And as soon as they're jiggling around, they're getting hot, so it cooks your food. There's very little danger of it causing phase explosion of your food. It's just likely, statistically likely, over a period of time, you're just going to end up heating that food up. And that's exactly what we're doing here. So infrared is a cut off really for lasers. You don't get very many lasers longer than infrared. Certainly not using industry. So that's why wavelengths are really important. But there's other considerations for us to talk about as well. I've spoken just now about um, why wavelengths are important, but I've also been making quite um, laboured points to say how short these pulses are. Let's talk about the pulse of a laser next. So a lot of the lasers that we use, um, the two that we use the most actually, uh, for like really high end micro machining, you tend to pulse them. And I'll talk about why pulsing is interesting right now. So if you have a laser with constant wave, i.e. it's a continuous stream, the two CO2s are like that, what you get is you say, well, okay, I've got my 60 watts, but to get 60 watts, I need to produce 60 joules per second of energy. So that's quite a, a, big, a big number of joules, fine. But it will get to a certain level. Let's just draw it across there, fine. It's, it's constant, never disappears. That's what we call a constant wave laser. But... What we have in this room is we've got other lasers which have got um, very short pulses. So 300 millijoules over there, and then this one here is also about 300 millijoules, but in a different wavelength. Why is that important? Well, let's put it this way. Suppose that we want to say we're going to deliver a certain amount of joules in a pulse. So the laser can deliver a pulse for 20 billionths of a second, 20 nanoseconds, and within that 20 nanoseconds, it's going to deliver a third of a joule. Okay? That's fine. Sort of makes sense, I suppose. But let's talk about what that means in terms of this. So here, remember, we're talking nanoseconds on here. So if I draw something that's 20 nanoseconds long, that, to make a whole second's worth at 60 watts, is going to go on and on and on. I, I really shouldn't write that, actually. This should be power. Power in watts. Fine. So, if we were to talk now about the idea of something that does 20 nanoseconds worth, uh, 20 nanoseconds of pulse, the laser pulse shape is a cascade when you get a pulse. So, that Exmo can do 200 a second of these, flat out. What we get is we actually get something that looks like it'll go, it'll go, it'll be much higher than this, much, much, much higher. 
It tends to have a long tail, so I've actually drawn that quite badly. This should be more forward biased. The energy which is delivered is the area under here. So this is where the mathematics starts to come in. We can take an integration with respect to time to work out the amount of power delivered over a unit period of time. So you end up getting your energy. This one, remember this is carrying a constant wave, never stops. It's going to be very, very low in comparison because you're only you're having to integrate across a whole second like that. So I've drawn it quite high here, but in reality, in comparison, it be very, very low. Now let's think about the materials that you're trying to hit with these lasers. Those atoms are sitting there quite happily, normally, until you try and shine a very bright light at them. This one, you've only got a certain amount of uh, potential to cause damage. This one, look at the height you can get to. You can really deliver a massive, very big sucker punch. Damage threshold. Very, very quickly. So peak power of a pulse laser can be absolutely enormous. Remember, I'm measuring power on the y-axis. The peak power of this one, the pulse laser, can be colossal in comparison to a constant wave. So quite often what you'll see is the power rating of a constant wave laser is much higher, stated at 200 watts or something, or you can even get 5 kilowatt lasers, but the peak power of a pulse laser can be absolutely enormous in comparison. And coincidentally the damage that they can do will be very, very um, controlled and small, but instant. It just immediately overcomes the material. So that's why a pulsed laser can be useful, basically. What's the problem with a pulsed laser? Well, the eczema laser, 200 flashes per second. Say you want to try and create, create a long track in your material. Say you want to try and machine, um, for instance, something you might try and do with an eczema laser. You might try and create um, a circuit board with it, a micro circuit board. I'll explain how in the next part of this video. But say you want to try and create track width, so eventually we've got our material. We want to try and machine a trough into our material that looks like this here. The eczema laser is very, very good at that, and this depth here will be, um, I don't know, let's just choose a number, let's say that's uh, 20 microns, so 20 millionths of a metre deep. So with the eczema laser, say in polycarbonate, a, a polymer, um, a very resistive polymer, I reckon that would probably take you, from my experience, maybe 10, maybe 15 pulses. Okay? So if it's taking you 15 pulses and you can only flash at up to 200 hertz, you're not going to be able to go this way to create your trap very quickly, are you? Because you're going to have to sort of like step the stages forwards as you machine the track into it. So can be quite slow. However, notice the size of that. The control is incredible. You can do even clever, cleverer stuff of this, and I'll explain why in a moment. With the 1064 one, that can only um, flash at 10 hertz maximum. So that one is no good at all for machining things where like, you've got tracks or like, trying to scan the beam across. So this galvanometer we've got on here, you really need to have a very, very fast flashing laser, so kilohertz, or it needs to be constant wave for a galvo. So you start to see now there's an awful lot of intricacy into choosing a laser for a job. There's a number of different um, specifications that are critical that you think about before you try and choose the best tool for your job, just like it would be with traditional handheld tools. There's always a particular tool for a particular task. Okay, so next what I'll talk about is the shape of a beam that comes out. What I'll just say is, the thing we've talked about now, describe the temporal profile of a laser pulse and why it's important. Now I'm going to talk about the actual shape of a beam that comes out of a laser. Now most people, if I say laser to them, they think, oh, James Bond, he nearly got cut in half by Dr. By Blofeld uh, with a laser. And it's just like a, a visible, bright, ready sort of stream that came up in, in between his legs until just in time he got saved. You can make a laser that will look a bit like that, but if you were to see it, you'd have to have lots of particles floating around in the air, so it would be a really dusty environment. You can't see a stream of light unless it can bounce off something into your eyes. Now, with a high-power laser, if you've got anything that basically bounces off into your eyes, that's bad. You need to run away. You'll go blind very, very quickly. So, in this room, 
everything we have. The, our research table, give you an idea, our research table, this is open optics. So in here we've got uh, beam splitters, various magnifying optics, and this is a, a fibre on there, so we can deliver from here into there for a, a particular application. That optics is open. If we're working this laser, we have to have uh, specialist goggles. I'll go and get a set right now. Here we've got two sets of goggles, and they're very specialist. They're tested and certified to be able to resist in this case, this particular wavelength, um, for over a third of a second, because that's a blink response. So it will not pass the damage threshold of your retina for a third of a second at a certain intensity that this laser cannot achieve, basically. So we have to wear these to protect us when we've got open optics. This is for 1064, these ones are for 532. These will also help a bit of 532, but nowhere near as well. Um, so this is... Um, the protection we have to wear and you would be utterly stupid not to wear these. When I started working in lasers, the company I worked in there was a bit of a, a culture of like, well I've never gone blind before, you know, today might be your day, so um, you don't do it. The, these ones will go straight through the lens of your eye and just destroy your retina straight away. That big grey box there will give you a cataract instantly. No, I don't really fancy a cataract operation. If you get a full blown blast on your, um, the lens of your eye, that will just immediately give you a cataract. So be careful when working lasers. They are really cool and they're loads of fun and they're dead easy to do some really cool stuff with. But value your eyes. <laughs> um, so when all the other lasers here, you'll notice they're specialist enclosures. So all the optics that I'm going to talk about now to manipulate the beam from that eczema are encased within a metal cage. And underneath this cage is actually another centimetre thick piece of aluminium. It's a bit overkill, but we just want to make sure that it can't be melted, you can't get melt through off of CO2. So we're very careful to make sure that um, stray beams can't happen. Back to my analogy to James Bond. The other thing that you won't get often with a laser beam is it won't just come out of the laser at a perfect uh, focus. You won't get an extremely narrow laser beam. What you'll get is you'll get a functional laser beam. The little one over there, that produces about two or three millimetres diameter. This one, uh, out of this part of the laser there, works at about five or six millimetres diameter. The eczema laser is very, very, very different. The eczema laser produces a square laser beam and it's, uh, at the moment, where we've got it tuned, it's 12 millimetres wide and it is about 5.4 millimetres high rectangle. But it doesn't end there in, sim in sim complexity, I'm afraid. If I were to take a cross section and the power distribution across that beam, so I'll draw some yet, yet more axes, what it would actually look like is Gaussian in profile. So at the edges it's got very little, very little energy, in the centre it's got shed loads. Fine but that can pose a serious, serious problem. What happens if I'm passing my beam through, the beam on almost all lasers is a myth that lasers don't diverge. By diverge, I mean they don't spread out. All lasers do it, it's just by varying amounts. When you buy a high power laser, it will state on the box, on the specifications, the divergence angle that comes with the laser, and it will be measured in milliradians. Now, Lower power rate lasers get better, you can also do things to tune the design to ensure that that gets smaller, but for high powered ones it tends to be reasonably high. It's all part of something we call the M squared number, which is to do with the beam quality factors. A horrible unit because it's unitless. Um, we'll, what we'll do to try and get our laser beam to work is it will, it will go along reasonably collimated, so reasonably parallel, and then we'll put it through a focusing lens. And of course what a focusing lens does is it focuses all the photons until they actually cross over at some point. And the point at which they cross over is the focus point. You've got all those photons crisscrossing each other in a really small space. So that's how all of these work. All of these lasers have a focusing lens to actually do the damage, to cause the spark, to get the high intensity to do the machining. That's fine. Now suppose I want to try and machine something with this beam. This beam has got this Gaussian profile. All of these lasers have a Gaussian profile. Every single one. Okay, most high power lasers have a Gaussian profile. All the ones in this room do. The reason that you get a Gaussian profile across a beam 
is uh, to do with the geometry of the cavity in which the laser beam is generated. You can get different profiles, they're more complex, I won't explain those, I'm going to give you a very simplified overview as to why you get a Gaussian profile. Firstly, Gauss, great mathematician, it generally seems a statistical distribution of frequency, and that's actually a very good way of thinking about it in this case, because the intensity of the light across the beam, spatially across the beam, is a measurement of a number of photons existent in that particular localised space across the beam. So, let's talk about the way a laser works. I've written up here the word pump, so the way a laser works, somehow there's an excitation source for the gases inside the chamber. Here's our chamber, but at the moment the chamber's unbounded. These are the sides, we want the laser to go in this axis here. So the pump comes in and it causes our our um, various chemicals, the molecules inside our chamber, to become excited. Now, these soak up the, um, the wavelength from the pump, they become excited and start to oscillate, and they'll start to emit lots and lots of energy. Now, of course, there's nothing to tell these um, molecules here which way they should emit. They could emit like that, they could emit like that, but of course, Statistically speaking, they're definitely going to do something around this angle here. Okay, so we, we know that there's, gonna, there's a likelihood that's going to happen. How can we make sure we gather as much of that as possible and try and make it sort of bounce backwards and forwards inside this cavity? Well, one of the common ways to do it in a high power laser, and the way it's done for certainly the CO2 lasers in this room, is to basically have two parabolic mirrors at either end. So rather than being a flat mirror like you get in your bathroom, they'll have a curve. So we've got one here and one there. Now critically, one of these mirrors is completely and utterly non-transparent, or as close to non-transparent as we can make it. It's so very, very reflective. I'm going to choose one on the left here. So anything which hits this is going to want to go back into the cavity. This one over here, however, is slightly different. This one will let some through, okay? Not all, but some through. But anything it doesn't let through, it bounces back within reason. So this one has got semi-transparency, okay? So that means over here, this is our aperture, this is, which, this is the way the laser beam is generated, that's how we're going to get a beam out the other end. Right, so now imagine what's going on here. We've got this photon, and all of the photons inside this chamber producing things at this angle, and so now what we've actually got going on is lots of things rattling around inside between these sort of angles here. Right? That's fine. This is quite wide. Laser beams normally seem to be quite narrow. So what could you do? You could put what we call an aperture. So imagine we literally put a hole here and the laser beam comes out with that sort of diameter. Now, that's fine. Statistically speaking, imagine what we're going to see across that beam. Across that beam, what you're going to get is you're going to have, um, so this is our uh, cross section as it were, so this we could say is distance across the axis, it's called the transverse mode, um, and we're going to have, if this is the central axis of the laser here, so zero, we're going to end up with something that looks a bit like that. And then on the other side, we're going to have something that looks a bit like that. Okay? So that's why you end up with a statistical um, distribution called a transverse mode across the laser beam. There are a number of different transverse modes. You can get asymmetrical ones, you can get symmetrical ones. Asymmetrical ones can look really cool. It can be like donuts, or um, even like a, the sort of shape you get when you drop something into a pool of water and you get a set of ripples running out. Lots of different modes, but this one called TEM, transverse electromagnetic mode, zero, zero, is known as the Gaussian mode. There is more complexity to it than that in reality because um, within a chamber, if you change these lengths, you actually change the harmonic frequency of the light which gets through because obviously they're rattling in here. If you change this length, then different things are going to want to rattle at different rates. So you can end up with multiple different wavelengths, only very, very fine changes, so nanometer difference, or even less than a nanometer difference, between wavelengths. 
they can combine in different ways and because these are travelling different distances as you run through this angle you can also get different interference patterns and if you are familiar with um, the interference of waves from A-level physics uh, will know what I'm talking about there. So there's lots of different reasons why you can end up with quite a messy shape here um, or even extremely different uh, modes like that. Generally speaking, the primary um, cause for a mode is the geometry of the cavity, the boundary conditions you put in. This is a big problem. Imagine we wanted to try and machine some material. So once again, I'm going to get my piece of material and I'm going to try and make my notch. Okay. Big problem there, that's got a flat bottom. That's not a flat beam profile. So actually, if I try to machine that without mucking about the beam, what you probably end up actually getting is something that sort of looks like, oh dear, it looks terrible like this. That's not very good. In fact, it's probably even worse than that. You probably end up actually doing something like that because the centre's got really high power and the edges have got zilch. So that's poor, it's not acceptable, you can't work with that, you can't make anything. So what do we do? We do something called homogenisation. Now there's a number of different ways we can go about doing beam homogenisation. You can do it um, with uh, diffractive, uh, diffractive gratings, so you can pass the photons through a narrow slot and make them expand, and if you control those diffractive gratings you can get them to recombine in a more even fashion. Or you can put them through a micro lens array. And if I give you, draw you a quick micro lens array. Imagine we've got a little set of lenses that look like that. And on the other side, we've got the opposite side. There is a very specific geometry to this. I'm not going to attempt to draw it because it's difficult. The beam comes in with its Gaussian profile like so, and it's designed so that this outer edge is done like so, and then this inner edge is done like so, and so on, and so forth. So you're mixing the beam, and what you end up with at the end, after homogenization, so this is raw, what we actually aim for, and a good homogenous beam, should look, we call it a top hat profile, should look something a bit like that. So now we've got this reasonably flat top. If you've got a flat top, you can actually achieve this within reason. Okay, that's another optical element that has to go into here. We've got one there. So this is a micro lens array, as held by Princess Anne on opening day. Now it looks like I'm on crime watch, doesn't it? It's exactly the effect, but can you see how it's averaging out the image of me? So I can see the camera now bits of different elements of a camera and each one of those what looks like pixels but it's being done optically. So that is a homogenizing array. It's got another half that does that corrects and basically stops the expansion of a beam here. This other half prevents this from getting any wider. So that's a homogenizing array, that's about five thousand pounds. It's made out of pure quartz because only quartz is transparent at two four eight nanometers. No, transparent enough at 248 nanometers. Okay, so talked about beam shape. Last thing, we'll talk about actual machining strategies. I said in the previous part that the Exima laser puts out a laser beam that has got a shape like that. It's an oblong. So I said 5.4 and about 12 millimeters wide. What we do to actually do the machining, obviously, is we shrink that down, we focus it down. But if, before we got that far, we've gone through, we've done our homogenization, so now we're pretty comfortable that our beam looks something a bit like that. So we've got even energy distribution, the best we can achieve across the whole thing. That could be quite useful. Now, you've all seen graffiti and stuff. You can use a stencil or a spray paint. So now, what happens if I were to draw, like, I don't know, um, something a bit like that. So I could let the light pass through everything barring this, so this is all filled in, and I can basically make a raised version when you machine it of my name, but it can be a microdot. 
So that whole thing could fit into something a millimetre across of the optics we've currently got. If you were to buy higher power magnification lenses, you can get it down to, without diffraction limiting, I reckon you probably get down to about a third of a millimetre wide. So you can make micro dots with it. Now let's think again, let's think, okay, what if I've got this space? Why don't I draw a set of decreasing sized circles like so? And then as I flash the laser, after I've demagnified it, I move the material forwards like that. What do I create? I create a whole set, if you're looking across it, of micro lenses. So one of the ways that I got involved with laser micromachining, um, back when I was in my early 20s during my engineering degree, I worked on helping develop one of the very first lenticular 3D screens. So we were literally building the micro lens arrays using machining from an eczema laser to build up these specialist um, experimental lens shapes across the screen and then basically without having to wear glasses you've got a 3D screen, you can now see them in airports, NEC make them. So you can create two and a half dimensional structures using special scanning strategies. This scanning strategy is um, developed by a guy called Carl Boland who I still work with which is nice, he lives in Switzerland now. He um, he came up with it's called synchronized image scanning. S I S. Synchronized image scanning. And that is this idea of creating two and a half dimensional objects like that. You can even do a simpler one which is called mask dragging. dragging. This is a mask, so I'm masking off a bit of a beam. That's a mask. What if I were to do a great big thing like that and block all the light out in there so the light can go through the triangle, drag it through? What you'd end up doing is creating a V shape in the material. So instead of, this is a cross section of my machine material, but this is, I don't know, 20 microns deep. And that is, I don't know, 5 mic microns deep, not wide even. So you can do micro machine, create different shapes, and this could be 10, 15, 20 centimetres long. You just literally start the laser off, it starts pulsing, and you just drag through. It's called mastering. So these, these lasers, they're good for making small things, the micro-engineering world. I'm not going to say nano because we get to fraction limited before that. A lot of people use nanotechnology at the moment, it's a buzzword. Very few things are truly nano in size. Nano suggests that there are functional objects which are less than a micron or a millionth of a metre in width pretty hard to achieve, even with electron beam scanning. You can do it, but it's tough. Light, you've heard about diffraction in your GCSE physics. Diffraction happens at roughly, guide, 10 times the wavelength. So 248 nanometers. If I try and machine anything smaller than 2.5 microns across, it will start losing information. It's a quantum hard point. You can't get round it easily. The only way you can get around it is to um, use those specialist homogenizing lenses to create an interference pattern which has then got a higher density than the diffractive limit. Very complex maths, a lot of Fourier transforms. Um, that's a brief conceptual introduction to the basic facets of applying lasers to an application. I'm really an eczema laser specialist, so I have leaned towards that. But the principles stand across all of these lasers. It's a, a complex and growing field, and there is an unbelievable uh, breadth to the areas where you can apply a laser, as I'm learning now. I mean, we're applying to the food industry. There's one probably in your laptop. Um, if you own a LED or an LCD TV, it would have almost certainly picked personally for laser during manufacture. Um, it's all sorts of applications. It's an exciting world. Lasers were 50 years old last year, two years ago, um, and I see them basically proliferating in our society because there are no other mediums other than electromagnetic radiation that can pass through a vacuum and deliver energy from one point to another. Electricity must pass through a cable or through a conductor 
Electromagnetic radiation, like light, can go through a vacuum of space for billions of years and not get attenuated. So I hope you enjoyed that and I hope this is a good start to this series of webinars for the University of Lincoln College of Science.